Hi, this is Sam Price with the University of Idaho, and today's REM 151 lecture is on adaptive management. So to start off, <coughs> rangelands are dynamic. They're constantly changing over space and time. Um, we describe change over space and time usually using state and transition models. But how do we as managers manage for transition? Um, this is where adaptive management comes into play. So the bulk of the information presented in this lecture today was taken from a paper titled Managing Complex Problems in Rangeland Ecosystems. Um, within this paper written by Chad and Tony, um, is listed four um, objectives. The first objective is differentiating simple and complex problems. The second objective is examining the importance of evolutionary knowledge acquisition in addressing complex problems. <clears throat> the third is discussing barriers to adaptive management of complex problems. And the fourth is the proposition of an alternative to traditional adaptive management that involves strengthening the relationship between science and management over years and across sites. Um, so the first step is differentiating simple and complex problems. Using watershed terminology, we can think of simple problems as point source problems and complex problems as non-point source problems. Um, talking about water pollution, a simple problem would be, you know, a, a single pipe coming from a single building that is pushing effluent out into a nearby stream. Um, one problem, um, one source, so it's relatively simple to take care of. Uh, you just eliminate the source and eliminate the problem. Uh, complex problems, however, are usually uh, involve multiple non-point sources. So here, when we're looking at, um, so here in this diagram on the right, we're looking at uh, several non-point sources that are all adding pollution to this water system. So we have croplands, forestry, homes, cities, a um, whole host of non-point sources that are adding to this problem. Um, if we as managers were to try and solve this problem, you know, we would need to come at it from multiple angles, from a forestry angle, from a cropland angle, from a city angle, from a development angle, um, you know, animal feedlots, just like all of a sudden this problem is so much more complex. The amount of effort and time that would go into a complex problem versus a simple problem is <clears throat> pretty extraordinary. So focus again here is on differentiating simple and complex problems. Um, simple problems are often harder to differentiate from complex problems than we may want to initially admit. Um, so here I have a few kind of definitions um, and some examples. Uh, simple problems are defined as those which the input and the relationship <clears throat> between the variables at hand are pretty much constant. Um, <clears throat> You know, all of the working parts of this problem are all constant over time and space. Um, when problems are constant, the solution to that problem is generally pretty simple because there is just one answer. Um, under these circumstances, management actions usually have predictable outcomes for single problems. Then we look over at complex problems and when we start looking at complex problems, all of a sudden the input variables are not constant and they tend to change across space and time. This is where a lot of the difficulty comes because no longer does one answer solve the problem. And even if it does, 
it may only work for so long, you know. Um, something that worked at first over time begins to not work, so we have to adapt and come up with another solution to somehow solve the same problem. Um, the appropriate solutions to a complex problem obviously need to vary over time and space. And then um, given enough time we see simple problems transform into complex problems as the scale increases. So in Chad and Tony's paper they list some brutal facts. Um, I guess back up a little bit. Now that we've basically differentiated simple and complex issues, um, we're going to move on to why adaptive management is necessary to improving rangelands. In Chad and Tony's paper, they list two brutal facts which emphasize the um, which emphasize why adaptive management is essential to um, management success. Uh, the first brutal fact is that no single conservation entity can really handle all aspects of a task. The second is that there are significant knowledge gaps which exist and will continue to exist because of the complex nature of problems. How do we minimize the effects of such brutal facts? That would be through adaptive management. So this is where we really start to get into adaptive management. Um, here we are looking at one kind of version. Here on the right, we're looking at one of the many versions of the uh, adaptive management loop or wheel. Um, this is the one that's used in Chad and Tony's paper. It emphasizes um, learning, planning, and implementing, and learning again. Kind of the primary concept that drives pretty much any version of this adaptive management wheel is that it's cyclic. Um, what is learned is incorporated into our management plans. Um, we then implement and monitor what has been planned and then our monitoring is evaluated, learned from, and then incorporated back into our planning. So it's cyclic. It repeats itself over and over and over again. So this is the evolutionary part when we start talking about knowledge acquisition. Um, what we initially learn, we plan for, we then implement it, we monitor and evaluate it, we, we learn from what we had initially planned, and then based on the outcomes of what we learned, we can alter our plans in the future. Um, so the idea here is that because our rangelands are constantly changing both spatially and temporally, our solutions also need to change spatially and temporally. Um, so without some sort of evolutionary knowledge acquisition or you know adaptive management solutions tend to stay constant while our problems evolve and increase in complexity. So. Um, this is the this is one of the big selling points for adaptive management. So this is a second kind of example or another version of the adaptive management loop. This is the one used by the National Park Service. Um, we start at the top and we see you know field assessment. This is where we're you know we're making our initial assessment. We're developing objectives. We're implementing actions, we're monitoring, we're evaluating, and we're learning and incorporating knowledge. And then this all goes back into our assessment and the development of our management objectives. Um, another way to think about adaptive management is that it's essentially a feedback loop, which supplies us as land managers with either positive or negative feedback in which to alter our management objectives with. So the third objective that Chad and Tony get into are barriers to adaptive management of complex problems. So basically what I have here on the right is 
a map of the greater sage grouse habitat range um, in western North America. So the dark green, or I guess the, uh, you know, the dark green is their current range and this light green color is their historic range. Basically all we need to focus on for this is just the current range, so the dark green. Um, and we're looking at this dark green and we're asking ourselves what might be a few barriers to management that we could imagine when managing for something like greater sage grouse habitat. Um, so we're looking at it, you know, for starters, it spans one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine states, 10, 11 states, 11 or 12 states. So when we start talking about managing for greater sage grouse habitat, all of a sudden we have to get 11 states into the mix. We have to start talking. So all 11 states have to start talking about managing for greater sage grouse habitat, you know, or at the very least, say we're somewhere in Eastern Oregon and we're talking about managing for greater sage grouse habitat, but say our sage grouse because sage grouse don't just sit still. We all know that, right? Um, these are animals. They move, you know, freely and at will. So the border between Oregon and Idaho isn't exactly going to stop them. Um, so if I'm in eastern Oregon and I'm attempting to manage for greater sage grouse, and I know that my greater sage grouse are moving at certain times of the year over into Idaho, where they're, you know, out of my range or my jurisdiction, I guess. I have to communicate with the people over in Idaho and talk to them about managing for this greater sage grouse habitat. So this is the difficulty is when we start managing across any of these imaginary lines that we've drawn on the map, state lines, county lines, um, agency lines, ownership lines, you know, private, public, um, the list of stakeholders all of a sudden becomes just longer and longer and longer. You know, just when we're looking at the people that are involved, when we start talking about all these lines, um, you know, and then when we add into the mix that <clears throat> because these are animals or, you know, we could take this into something else. We could talk about fire, you know, fire, does not obey state or county lines. Weeds do not obey state or county lines. And animals definitely do not obey state or county lines. They are gonna go wherever they want and do whatever they want. If we're gonna manage for them, we need to go into the mix with that sort of state of mind that, you know, if I'm in Eastern Oregon and I wanna manage for fire or for weeds or for animal habitat, then I should probably be talking with people over in Idaho where my problem could spill over into their territory and become their problem just as easily um, by combining our efforts all of a sudden, you know, the problem can become less complex and at the same time it can also become more complex. So in Chad and Tony's papers, they list out four barriers to adaptive management. The first one that they go over is what they call programmatic success versus biological success. And this is basically saying that the nature of many of our federal agencies when confronted by a problem is often to create a program. These programs are then often charged, well they're not often charged, these programs are then charged with solving the problem. The example used in Chad and Tony's paper is post-fire reseeding. So instead of post-fire reseeding efforts um, being measured, you know, when we start talking about success, instead of being measured in terms of biological success, which would be, you know, there was a fire and we came back through it and replanted native seeds and, you know, X percent of those seeds that were planted also germinate and also establish. That would be biological success. You know, an established plant versus a seeded plant is an actual success. Um, but instead of measuring in terms of biological success, we often find 
um, our federal agencies measuring in what we would call programmatic success. So again, talking about post-fire receding, um, there's a fire, an agency creates a program, its goal is to reseed after a fire. So that program's goal is to seed so much seed over so many acres in so much amount of time. If you successfully you know, seed X amount of seed over X amount of acres in X amount of time, then it's considered a success. So we can kind of begin to sense the issue at hand here. Um, you know, as scientists, we may not consider that a success, but on a management level, we may consider that a success. So um, kind of taken with a grain of salt, however, you know, this paper was written back in 2009, which was which doesn't exactly um, take away from it at all. But um, things have changed since 2009. We do see agencies, many of our federal agencies measuring success differently today. Um, but it's important to keep this idea in the back of our minds when making any management decision is, am I planning for programmatic success or biological success? Um, one of the second issues they go over are conservation partner ecosystems. Um, this was kind of touched on in slide nine. Um, but basically complex problems require cooperation. Um, again, in slide nine, we were looking at barriers to adaptive management regarding sage grouse habitat. And one of the primary barriers that we identified was this long list of interstate and intercounty and interagency and private stakeholders that every complex problem in inherently includes. Um, you know, though these many stakeholders incre increase the complexity of an issue without their inclusion, um, proper management is impossible. In most any cases, these stakeholders will be the people who are implementing and monitoring any management plan. So without stakeholder approval, management plans tend to be doomed to fail. Um, I've worked with a few people who were involved throughout the um, planning process and were not so happy with the way that the uh, plan eventually was implemented. And it's kind of a bummer when you see something like that because, you know, um, they were in disagreement with the way that it was implemented. And so in turn, they had very little interest in whether or not the plan succeeded. And in a few cases that come to my mind, it, their actions were almost detrimental to the success of the plan. So um, when we as managers begin, you know, including stakeholders, and developing plans, um, it's just important to remember um, I guess it's just important to remember how important all of these stakeholders really are to the success of the plan. Um, without their input or without their sort of you know um, agreement, we can see a management plan completely and utterly fail. Um, it's just one of those sad realities of natural resource management. But um, another, a second kind of component to this barrier is also sort of the specialized nature of our education nowadays. Um, no single person or land manager really has all the answers. So when approached with a complex issue, nobody has all the answers to a problem, especially a complex problem. Um, land managers, however, can surround themselves with, you know, a group of well-informed specialists and all of a sudden um, a land manager is ready to face any problem, no matter how simple or complex it may be. Um, so fostering those relationships between stakeholders and specialists is extremely important for land managers. Uh, the third one that we go over is ecological frameworks, and this 
kind of starts looking at the theory practice gap. Um, and if you don't really know what the theory practice gap is, it's basically that there's a considerable difference between um, what is learned in school, which is defined as theory, and what actually goes on in the real world, which is defined as practice. Um, oftentimes, what we learn in school um, is very precise and complex, but the real world doesn't want precise and complex exactly. You know, we want cheap and fast and simple because, you know, we have limited resources, limited funds, limited time. Um, so um, theory has to kind of take a backseat once it enters the real world. Um, the key here is, however, in my opinion, to take those theories that we learn in school and adapt them for the real world. So kind of an example that I have off the top of my head is my current research is in um, well, it's involved with uh, seedling germination. So one of the pieces of equipment that I was uh, tasked with purchasing was a growth chamber. A growth chamber is basically a giant refrigerator that grows seeds. It doesn't stay cold, it stays warm, and it manages light and humidity. So um, growth chambers can get pretty expensive. I was seeing some for 10 grand, and you know those are for small ones, and they get more and more expensive as the size goes up. So, you know, um, that's what I needed for research. For me to produce um, good research, I needed a growth chamber. However, um, at one of the nurseries down the road, I was talking to the guy that runs it about my growth chamber, and he was laughing because he thought it was funny that I had spent that much money on a growth chamber and he took me into his uh, laboratory there at the nursery and he showed me his growth chamber and it was basically this old metal table that he had duct taped styrofoam to the outside of it and had mounted a light underneath it and that was his growth chamber. It was extremely cheap and it totally worked for him. Um, Though this duct tape growth chamber would ne not work for me in regard, like, it would not be precise enough for me to do my research and produce a, a thesis paper on. Um, but in the real world, where we're just looking for, um, what is the word I'm looking for here? You know, in the real world, where we're just looking for um, something that's effective. It totally worked. So kind of, again, the whole idea is to take these theories that you learn in school and find ways to adapt them to real world scenarios. Um, the fourth barrier listed is just simply range management and space and time. Simply put, it's just difficult to manage anything over space and time because it's hard to perceive. Um, nobody really knows how a problem is going to change over time um, and trying to fathom how a problem would change over space is very difficult. Um, and then when we look at the amount of time and effort that goes into managing rangelands um, from kind of an agency's perspective, um, we already have these ever dwindling budgets and these limited funds. Um, Adaptive management, though it is essential to the effective management of rangelands, adaptive management is kind of in itself a barrier to itself. Um, adaptive management compared to maybe more conventional or traditional modes of uh, management is a little bit more complicated. So we're talking about extra time, extra effort that goes into adaptive management versus um, conventional management. So that extra time and effort included in planning and monitoring involved with adaptive management is extremely difficult to accomplish without necessary time and money. And as we see agencies, you know, natural resource agencies, the amount of money that they have to work with ever dwindle, um, you know, adaptive management becomes more and more difficult to implement.
So the last objective is propose an alternative to traditional adaptive management that involves strengthening the relationship between science and management across years and sites. All right. So we're looking here on the left and we see a description of kind of an old model of um, an older model describing the communication between science and research. Um, there's an issue, so, or sorry, I back up. Um, this old model describing the relationship between management and research, not science and research, um, between management and research and the way it kind of depicts it is, you know, there's a problem. So the manager contacts the researcher. The researcher looks at the problem, he gives the manager some results, and then that's the end of their communication until the next problem arises, you know, or the problem changes. Then the manager, so say problem one is identified by the manager. The manager tells the researcher about problem one, the researcher researches problem one and gives the manager back results one. Um, the manager implements result one into or incorporates result one into a management plan and then in, implements that management plan. Um, years later, all of a sudden, result one no longer apply to maybe the same problem that they had years ago. So he has to recontact the researcher. The researcher has to re-research, give them more results, which they can then incorporate into management plans. So it's just this kind of like broken communication I feel like everything I just said over the last minute was very confusing. But I mean, it's supposed to be kind of confusing. It's just this like broken communication that doesn't foster a lot of trust. I mean, the manager speaking to the researcher cannot be the same manager speaking to the same researcher the second time around. So it's just like the whole thing is very confusing, very broken, and doesn't foster a whole lot of trust. Um, and um, trust is pretty big part of uh, adaptive management um, without the manager being able to trust the research that the researcher is providing um, how is the manager to supposed to make informed decisions how is the researcher really supposed to understand what the problem is if you know the trust between them and the the manager is limited or if the communication between the researcher and the manager is limited it's just it's hard for both sides to get a handle on an issue if there's this broken communication that kind of is a uh, dividing them so the model that is kind of proposed um, in Chad and Tony's paper on the right is this model where um, the researcher and the managers are kind of in this constant communication um, so information is constantly flowing from one to the other and back and forth and back and forth. And um, kind of through this increased communication, there's an increased um, level of trust that is fostered. So we see a, a much stronger relationship between research and management, which is important because um, without research again without research managers cannot make informed decisions and without managers researchers really can't implement any of their work so both need each other um, both need each other in order to succeed um, and then kind of another thing that goes along with this or another aspect of this whole um, increased communication this um, kind of fostered trust between the two of them comes um, more powerful uh, research goals and management objectives um, if management and research is in constant communication um, when we start looking at implementing new management objectives all of a sudden you know maybe the management objectives are more geared towards the research what the research is able to do and the research is able to gear their research towards maybe more or less what the management objectives are so all of a sudden now 
this whole process is becoming simpler. And as we said in slide 10, adaptive management is in itself a barrier to itself due to its complexity. So any chance to simplify this adaptive management process needs to be explored. Um, and through fostering trust and increasing communication between researchers and managers, um, we believe that this is possible, um, just simplifying the whole process and improving the research and the management objectives that we can um, create through this process. So this is just kind of a recap of what went over today. Um, on the right is the adaptive management wheel from Chad and Tony's paper. And on the left are the four objectives that we kind of went over. Um, that'll be all today.